And I, it, it, it's something I never quite got my finger on. He knew Spielberg through Quincy. Well, Captain E. Like, Captain Walker is so much yeah, right, exactly. he, it's, 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 it's running away he, from who he is, trying to escape. But I to he, he never, he should have, but never did marshal his celebrity to make the big feature film spectacular that he should have. And I'm not quite sure why that was that he wanted too much control, which may have been part of it. Because if you're going to work with Spielberg or Coppola or George Lucas, it's going to be, they're going to run the show as much as you will. And, and so, I don't know, I don't think he's too shy to make a movie. He should have, he should have, he should have made, that's, I think that's the only thing I'm missing out of, out of all the whole package, is there should have been this big screen, 3D Michael Jackson movie. And I think there was a time when it should have happened, and that was really in this period after Thriller. I mean, you know, all that whole period, he was the biggest star in the world. How that didn't happen, it's almost like another narrative. How Hollywood messed that up. And also, also in the era of, you know, there weren't that many still black stars. It was still Eddie Murphy. So it wasn't like there was a ton of competition. It was Eddie, there was no Will Smith. You know, it was really a, a problem. I just, I, when I look at the whole totality of this amazing career. The other thing I wanted to, to talk about, I talked about Joe a lot, is Michael's relationship to, to, to black men fatherhood, I guess you might say. And that is, you know, his relationship with Quincy is really interesting because if you look at the three records they made, the first one off the wall, is Quincy guiding Michael. Michael writes songs, but Quincy finds Rod Temperton. Uh, between, Quincy gets Paul McCartney to give him a girlfriend. Um, they get Stevie, who's a friend of both of theirs, to give them um, that great song. You know, um, that whole, the album is so strong throughout. Uh, but it's really a Quincy Jones manufactured taking this young guy and holding The second album, this, you know, Michael writes, beat him. Michael writes Billy G. No, it's like, yeah. Right, Billy G. I was thinking about Rod Shepard something like that. And Thriller. Um, oh, and all these songs that, that Michael, he wrote a few, there's like three or four key songs. But there's also the sense of balance, because it's sort of some Quincy stuff that's in there, the songs he found like Human Nature, which is really Quincy's concocted that. That was a song, a, a bit of a song, you hear one of the guys from Telltale had. He found the lyricist, this guy John Bettis, who used to, who's like a real pop songwriter. And Quincy put Human Nature together, literally. Michael, but it was quite crafted for his voice and his persona. By the time you get to bed, it's virtually it's a Michael Jackson, almost every song that Michael wrote. It's his, he's now the adult, he's now in charge, he's now running things. Except for maybe Man in the Mirror, maybe one of the songs. Michael, you know, wrote almost everything about album. So it's interesting that you can see the relationship change. And to me, after he got so big, he felt like he didn't need Quincy. He moved on to Teddy Riley. Teddy, but Teddy, but that's a different relationship. Teddy's going to come in as, even though Teddy was a hot producer, it's Michael Jackson's show. And it's a really funny story. Uh, I interviewed Teddy for uh, Hip Hop Honors, I think, a couple years ago. He told this incredible Michael Jackson story, which tells a lot about Michael's process post Quincy and also how you can run through a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> so he gets Teddy. Teddy, fly, Teddy flies Teddy out to his house on a helicopter. Teddy lands on, on Neverland land, and there's like eight security guards fly up and grab him, take him into a room. He hangs out, Mike, he finally meet, they start talking, and um, he convinces, you know, Teddy to come. Teddy said, great, I want to work with you, but you got to move to L.A. Not only does he move into L.A., he builds a bedroom in the studio where they record for Teddy to stay there. Michael has a room too, but I mean, like, Teddy, you're here to make this record. <laughs> Teddy spent like, I think he said he spent like a, a, over a year, you know, making this record with Michael, tracks after track after track. Uh, at one point, this, this, is a, this is a classic story. He's working with something, Michael, I, said, I gotta go out for a minute. Michael goes out, Teddy's messing around, I keep running. I think I got it. Mike, can you get Mike for me? Uh, uh, we'll have to run him down for you. He gets a call. Mike's on a plane to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to play this year to open up a, a shopping mall that, you know, he's got investment. But that's how time works. He can, you know what I mean? He can fly off. And that's the difference between, you know, the young Michael and the older one is that now he controls everything. And time, instead of making Thriller in six weeks, it takes years to make and a record. It takes years to accept that a record is right. And, and literally, um, talking to L.A. Reid, I went to L.A. Reid and we had this discussion on Michael. And 
he's talking about the fact, you know, we did all these songs. He, he said, you, don't, you can't believe how many songs Elliot and Baby's made, who were then the hottest guys in the game, wrote for him. And I think only one or two made on any of the records. Actually, if you get on a bus, you know, there's a, actually Elliot and Babyface get on a bus song. If you hear the movie, it's never released commercially. Spike doesn't even have a copy of it. Um, so, I mean, this, this idea that of, of making these records with Quincy in a very precise, orderly manner became this whole expanse. I, of, uh, I, I, I talked to Teddy, too, for this story that I wrote, and um, two things that jumped out. That you talked about Michael wanted to know how he would dance to each song. So he's dancing in the studio in a different way, and that's part of his songwriting Absolutely. process, that, that he's hearing the record, and he's figuring out how to move to it. And I think that's part of why you get so many of the guttural uhs and cha 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 and all those sort of things, because it's a sort of mouth way of dancing to the song and relating to it rhythmically before you start relating to it linguistically. Um, the other thing that Teddy said that was really interesting is Michael said, remix all the songs. And they sound like remixes. When he said that, I'm like, that makes so much sense. They sound like, you know, you know, you get the original version, which is cool, you know? And you can play it for your mom, you know? And then the remix comes out and it's dirty, it's nasty, it's complex, it's way more, it's heavier. And Dangerous to Me is like that. And Dangerous to Me is one of my three favorite, I think it's my third favorite, Michael Jackson album because I think the five songs on it that I love are so great and so funky and so complex and the rhythms and the mouth rhythms that you get. I mean, for me, Thriller is number two. There's so many great songs, but it's a collection. It's like a greatest hits record. It's not. There's a couple of bad songs on Thriller. Oh, yeah. sure, sure. I'll let you say that in public. I'm <laughs> like Bill. <laughs> 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 say for me. But to me, Off the Wall is the perfect, the best. And that's your party. Just let that happen. An interesting thing that comes out of these discussions is, is Michael in relation to hip hop. Um, he was a rhythm person. If you listen to the demos, if you hear him now in a bunch of the collections, these mouth rhythms, the feet rhythms, he was all about rhythm intensely. And almost every songwriter that he worked with talks about him coming in the room. It story says the mouth rhythms, the feet rhythms. Everything was about this, this intensification of the beat. Um, when I listen to a song like um, Jam, Jam to me is almost like the beginning of, new, of the new way of singing. Because, you know, what happened, uh, Wycliffe takes a lot of credit for this. He says when he remixed, I think, that Beyond, one of those, like, Jesse Child's record, he talks about how he broke it up into quarters and quarter notes. But if you listen to Jam, Jam almost anticipates this idea of, I'm going to change how melody lines are written. I'm going to chop them up, almost like a rapper. I mean, jam really is as close to rapping as probably you can hear a singer do. Um, and I always thought that that was, not only did he was a master of a certain R&B, but he actually created a new appro rhythmic approach to vocals that, that someone like Beyonce, who grew up on Michael, has taken it as her stamp. People will associate with Beyonce, but you can see it in Michael's work. So I, I think that's really interesting is that, that I always wonder, and I've been trying to find, does anybody have a tape? There's gotta be, Michael must have tried to rap at some point. <laughs> Now, he's got to, I've got to think he's trying to because anybody who's interested in rhythm as he was, who always, well, there was always beatboxing before it was beatboxing. I mean, yeah, you know, know, definitely have the beatboxing. You gotta think that he, he took a swing at it. Yeah. <laughs> we gotta find, we gotta find Teddy. Teddy, no. We talked about this, 